In this episode, Matt Kelly and I take a deeper dive into the allegations in the mud whistleblowing complaint against Twitter and explore some of the lessons learned for the cyber and anti-corruption compliance professional. Hello everyone, Tom Fox and Matt Kelly back for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Today we are going to continue a discussion we began around the whistleblower complaint filed by the former <clears throat> Twitter executive, Mudge. Matt took a look at the original complaint when it came out, but then he came back and took a little bit deeper dive into some of the specific controls. We thought we would follow up on Matt's blog post. So Matt, first of all, welcome back. Hello, Tom. Good to be back. Matt, in spite of the, either in spite of or because of the massive catastrophic set of allegations Mudge has put forward, you were able to mine some actually pretty distinct tactical lessons that we might learn from at least his allegations. So maybe you could set the stage with some of the, remind our audience of some of the broader allegations he made and then some of the control failures, which led to, once again, his allegations. Sure. This, the executive involved, his official name is Peter Zatko. And Peter Zacco, he's been known in cybersecurity circles for many years. He was the head of cybersecurity at Twitter for about 15 months from the end of 2020 until the start of 2022. And as you mentioned, Tom, his, I suppose you'd say his nom de guerre in cybersecurity circles is just Mudge. So that's how I typically call him and I know him. And he is very well known in cybersecurity. He's a very accomplished cybersecurity professional and thinker. But Mudge ran cybersecurity at Twitter for 15 months or so. It was a tumultuous time. And then he was fired in January of 2022. Mudge would say he was fired because the CEO and other senior executives at Twitter, CEO, his name was Parag Agarwal, that basically they didn't like to hear about the cybersecurity problems Mudge was raising. They meddled in reports he was trying to bring to the board. They sandbagged him on various other audits he was doing and all this other stuff. And we talked about that previously, Tom, on some of the bigger governance issues that I thought this raised. There's still a lot of really specific detail internal control failures that Mudge is also alleging against Twitter. The whistleblower complaint that he released is 84 pages long. So there's a lot in there about very specific inabilities to map data or to have user access controls and some ways that those failures would compound on each other. Small failures of control could actually lead to a very big risk. We could go on quite a bit, but it is well worth any compliance or privacy officer's time to sit down and read the complaint and think through if this sort of issue happened at my company, does it happen at my company that we might not have proper data mapping capabilities? Do we not have the right restrictions on employee access to data? Are we elevating the CISO to the right level in the company? There's a lot of really nitty gritty, specific thought provoking allegations uh, any compliance audit or privacy professional should think about. And it, like I said, it's 84 pages, a lot of it is redacted, so it's not really 84, but it is still well worth your time to dig up a copy online somewhere and just give it a read and see what he says. So let's start with the reporting both up and down the chain and specifically the CISO. Yeah. What did Mudge allege, or at least what did you divine from his allegations in terms of the CISO, his responsibility or lack thereof in reporting up, and why could that be viewed as not only a control failure, but perhaps a governance failure. His big allegation was that until he came along, th there was no CISO at Twitter in any functional sense, and that was the problem. So according to Mudge, the company didn't have any CISO in the 2010s and into 2020 until he was hired. And that really led to a lot of cybersecurity weaknesses that the company knew about, that the company had been talking to regulators about, weaknesses that weren't getting resolved because there was no senior level person who could really drive change at the business or work directly with the board to say, this board is why we have a big honking problem here and we need to put more resources in. There was nobody there fulfilling that role until Mudge got hired. Now, Mudge got hired 
after a couple of what I will call near-death experiences for Twitter with cybersecurity, where the company was hacked by Florida teenager and a couple of other knuckleheads who basically duped employees into giving them user access controls that then let them hijack accounts of high profile people, including Barack Obama, then candidate Joe Biden, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, we could go on and on. So there were loose access controls that these attackers managed to hijack the accounts. And then all they did was say, hey, millions of followers to these accounts, please send us Bitcoin. It was just a stupid financial scam. But it could have had grave implications for national security or social cohesion. What if they had taken over <coughs> Donald Trump's account and called for violence in the streets? Uh, people would believe that. And Donald Trump's followers, at least some of them, would probably do it. And that would could conceivably arise because of poor cybersecurity control. But it was after that near-death experience in 2020 when the then CEO, Jack Dorsey, hired Mudge to be the head of security and be functionally the CISO. That was essentially his title, head of security. And he was supposed to be working directly with the board. But for all of that talk about, is there a CISO? What level was he at? Should he have been higher? Should they have established that position at Twitter? One thing I was thinking about, Tom, is this is exactly what the SEC is trying to address with its new proposals for expanded cybersecurity discussion in a company's annual report. What are one of the big disclosures you would have to make if these rules get adopted, which they will sometime soon, rest assured listeners, but one of those rules or one of those disclosures would be to disclose who your CISO is and how that person reports to the board, if at all. If you don't have a CISO, you're gonna to have to explain why you think that having a assistant vice president of IT security is enough, but it's very clearly a pressuring tactic to get companies to realize, oh crap, we should have a chief information security officer. We should put it in the 10K that they brief the board every quarter or every year, or whatever it is. But this is exactly what the SEC is talking about is screw ups like what Mudge is alleging against Twitter, that they had these problems. They knew they had the problems, but they lacked the executive fortitude to grapple with them and get them solved. And then we're supposed to be surprised that a couple of idiots out of Florida managed to take over the accounts of some of the most important and notable people in the world. That's what happens when you don't have the right sort of governance structure to drive cybersecurity right up to the top of the priority list, especially if you're a social media company. So the, the, right there, like I said, food for thought, do you have the right executive in charge of IT security at your company? Why do you have that person where they are and are they sufficiently empowered? Are they dealing with the board in the useful way? Those are the kind of issues you could think about. We can go on from there because there are more allegations, but that struck me as one big one. Man, I've been studying the um, U.S. sentencing guidelines because it's the 30th anniversary of that. And there's some commentary yeah. around that from the U.S. Sentencing Commission. And one of the things the U.S. sentencing guidelines did was to elevate the compliance profession and the compliance professional, as well as they called it the CECO, but I'm going to call it the CCO. So I've been thinking about that. And what I really appreciated about this situation with Mudge, Twitter, and your blog posts really drove home to me as stark as an example, as I have seen recently, about why you need robust corporate governance, starting with the head of compliance in the particular discipline here, information security, why that person needs to have board access and senior executive moniker and leadership, and that if you don't have that and you're an information technology company, your most existential risk is your data. So you may be opening yourself up to other lack of corporate governance claims, i.e. Caremark. But you said a couple of other things I wanted to follow up on that I think are worth discussing and rediscussing because they may sound like basic lessons, but they're lessons that need to be heard again. And you use the word duped employees. And let's stick with the kids in Florida because they duped them about as basic a way as you can. So maybe you could tell us how they duped Twitter employees. And then the, but being duped was not the final step. 
because they duped them into giving passwords, which led them to the God control. So yes. why should you have elevated or lessening levels of access and why an entire corporate employee base should not be given access to the God control? Yeah, I love this. So here was how the Florida nitwits pulled off this high profile and really audacious attack is that they pretended to be IT, Twitter's, uh, Twitter's IT support and called employees at home and said, and basically asked them for their passwords. And some number of employees did give them their passwords. Now that is bad unto itself, but because of earlier flaws back in the 2000s, when Twitter was just starting and in its hyper growth phase, they basically gave every single employee administrator level access controls. They called it God mode. That is the mode I try to exercise over my kids at home. Doesn't work for me, but apparently Twitter employees just had God mode where they could rove around and look at any data and do any sort of transaction they needed because they had these super user administrative user privileges. So Twitter was supposed to have fixed that as part of a settlement with the 2011 uh, in 2011 with the Federal Trade Commission didn't fix it enough, apparently, because the Florida teens posed as I Twitter's IT help, called up, asked for employee passwords, got them, and they got the passwords of employees who still had God mode powers. So then they could suddenly go in to other users' accounts like Joe Biden or Barack Obama or Bill Gates and then start hawking for Bitcoin payments. There's all sorts of ways that is problematic, but it, really what we're talking about mapping out employee data access rights, the principle of least privilege, which has been around in audit and SOX compliance for forever, really, which is just give employees access to the data they need and nothing else. And that can go both ways. If you are a low level financial employee, you don't need much access to say, I don't know, issue a new vendor account or override internal controls. But by the same token, if that junior employee many years later becomes CFO, the CFO does not actually need authority to, say, approve an invoice. That's for the minions to do. The CFO is there to sketch out the big financial projections. So it's really a rigorous process of what's the some role the employee has, what data would he or she need to do their job, and don't give them access to anything else. Twitter messed that up didn't fix it in time because they didn't have a CISO elevated enough to get it fixed in a timely manner. And then they didn't have imp good employee training. So when a couple of knuckleheads from Florida and I think his compatriots were in Eastern Europe somewhere, when they posed as the IT help desk asking for passwords, employees fell for it. Like basic block and tackle stuff. But when you add it all up together, it creates this enormous risk of somebody being able to hijack the accounts of some of the most influential people in the world. And that's not good. And that was the other big lesson from Mudge's complaint is how these basic small scale internal controls, if you don't fix them, they can network together, for lack of a better word, to create the potential for much more serious risks to come home to roost. This is Tom Fox again. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. I hope you'll join Matt and I again next week where we take another deep dive into the compliance weeds.